Tell me, are you ready to find your weird way? Weird was a concept that was spoken of long ago. It meant fate. It meant destiny. It meant your path in life. I'm your host, Dean Bentley, and I am here to explore how you can connect to your own path in life, to know the essence of your own soul, to connect to that single spark that lives within the deepest recesses of your being that says, this is why I am here, to go beyond the limitations, the constrictions of the modern world and open you to the possibilities and the potentiality of what is possible within this world. Join me as we dive deep on The Weird Way. Welcome, welcome. We are back on The Weird Way. This is the first episode of season two where I get to bring a guest on and have another epic conversation. This one is very, very exciting for myself. I'm speaking to Seth Westhead, a speaker, a consultant, a mentor, and a creator. And we've been connected for the last few years, and he's been a man I've respected. I've got to see him in the work and what he's bringing to this world. And to be able to drop in and have this conversation, brother, I deeply appreciate your time, your energy, and having you here today. Welcome, man. 100% bro yeah no nah, thank you for having me on and it's um yeah a real privilege to be in your space and uh just sitting down to have a yarn mm-hmm. absolute pleasure man we actually connected uh probably two years ago when we set up an episode on your podcast the sentient savage and that was a delicious conversation we talked about myth we talked about story and i think that's something that's connected to both our hearts, which for me feels very alive. Where I wanted to take this conversation was before we jumped on, we started recording, we're having some conversations around what it means to be a creator in this modern age. And I think that's where a lot of the world is moving. And as creators, I I find that we are becoming the new storytellers of the modern age. So I'm curious on your views around what's it mean to be a creator when you say that you're a creator? What's that mean for you, man? Mm, I love that question, brother. Thank you. And this is something, the reason I say creator is because I feel like that word has room to evolve. It's not something that's been coined or defined just yet. And it's actually something that I feel like we all are. I feel like at our essence, we're all creative beings. And that can range from uh, creating a beautiful meal to creating a life that we love, um, manifestation and creating the things that we we think um, and also creating a human being, right? Like <laughs> I'm a father and I think one of the big realisations I had when I became a father was like, wow, this is what it means to be a creator. And if I can, well, it would co-create really, if I can be a part of a co-creation of another human being, then man, I can create anything, absolutely anything. And that, it was such a powerful and exciting um, realisation. And and what I now know to be true experientially is that I can create anything. Anything that comes to my mind I can bring that to life in, into this plane of existence. And that makes me feel just electric, absolutely electric. Um, like in, in some way I've like hacked the matrix and I, I know the secret, uh, but we can all do it. And I think that's what's another exciting thing for me is that it's possible for everybody. So, you know, being a creator for me, it's, um, it's my podcast is the Sentient Savage podcast is an aspect of creation um it's something that was in my mind that i brought to life um artworks digital artworks i do a little bit of that which is is creation creating rituals within my family um creating the life that we want to live creating um my work my body of work we spoke a little bit about legacy creating a legacy um all of those things come into to what it means to be a creator for me and um 
yeah, it's it's tapping into an energy that just allows things to flow through me and and be manifest in this plane of reality. So. I love that answer, man. And and a big part of what it reminded me of is this remembrance of our own divinity. Like we we are we come into this world and we have the possibility of creation. And I, I think for a lot of us, I know for me, when I started in this world, I was in a more survival level of consciousness. It was like, okay, I just need to do this to survive. Like that was why I wanted to go to uni. It's yeah. why I wanted to get the good job. And it was a path set out for me with the end goal being, okay, what can I do to just survive? There was an idea as of what I really, really wanted to do or what was the possibility of creation. It was just like, okay, this is just what you do. This a very one track lane and that consciousness doesn't support the opportunities and the awareness that more is possible within this world. And I know for me, when I started um, healing, I was, I was pretty depressed at the start of my journey. I started creating, which was small. It was like artwork, it was poetry. And I was like, oh my God, I have something inside of me that is unique, that is completely new to this world. No one had done that before, not in the mm. same way. And I think this realization is what gives us our spark and brings us back into like, oh my God, reality is something I can construct or I can build upon. And, and I'm wondering if there's something mm. you can speak into this or maybe your own journey of like when you discovered that you were a creator and, and what that was like for you. Mm. I've been reflecting on this actually, man. So it's it's timely that you bring it up. Uh, I was having a, a conversation with my wife the other day about the different evolutions of, I didn't call it creation, but the, the different evolutions of things that I've tried my hand at. Um, so yeah, it's really timely that this comes up. Um, these are a few things I've, I've just tried over the years, right? I remember uh, year nine um, in high school, the English teacher I had exposed us to this um, new website called Glogster is what it was called. And mm -hmm. you basically developed up the scrapbook type image and you could overlay songs on it and you could write and have pictures. And it was um, basically an interactive Instagram post. And I didn't say it to anybody, but when we got on this app, for our English class, class, I frothed it. I absolutely loved this fucking thing, man. It was so cool. And in the class, it was a bit like, oh, yeah, this is weird, whatever. We'll just do this for the teacher and then see you later. But I actively used it at home. So I was using it on my evenings after school. I was using it on weekends. Um, I was you know, putting song lyrics to, to songs and making cool images. I, I just really loved it. Um, it didn't really go anywhere, but it didn't need to. It was just about the creation aspect of things. It wasn't long after that, you know, year 10, I'd, I'd been interested in poetry and we, like, like you, and I'd got into writing some poetry actually through that same English teacher and it was for an assignment and I ended up writing six or seven different poems about aspects of, of reality like time and love and things like that. And then I started putting those, those, that poetry to music and I started getting into hip-hop. And I actually, for a time there, I started making hip-hop videos. So I would play and overlay um, hip-hop beats to my own raps and I started publishing those. I had them on YouTube. I was sharing them around the school. Uh, there was one time actually, so I grew up in a town, Mildura, uh, on the Murray River, just uh, on Barkindji and Lachi, Lachi country, which is right in the top corner of Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia where they all meet. And I did a rap video. I, I put a post out on Facebook and I said, everyone who likes this will be included in my next rap video. And there was about maybe 60 to 70 different likes on it. And I included every single person's name in my next YouTube rap video. And they, these were like other kids from all around the different schools in the Muldura area. So, you know, it was so fun, man. Like, and I, I didn't give a fuck what other people thought. 
Um, there was a little bit in me that, you know, you're a kid, you're a teenager that has that bit of judgment, but largely I just didn't give a fuck because I, I had so much fun. Um, and I stopped and I, I, I kind of can't remember why I stopped. Um, but I did, but I had so much fun doing that. And then the, the next iteration, I got into fitness pretty hardcore and I started making fitness vlogs and I started uploading those on YouTube and, Again, it, it was so much fun, man. I didn't care. I just, I really enjoyed it. And I got some criticism from people out in the world that's like, oh, fuck it, who do you think you are and this and that. But I just, my heart and my soul felt so nourished. I, I It felt so nourished, man. And um, I suppose it's in that, it's always been a part of, of who I was and, and really come out in my teenage years was, was where it started to flourish. And it's ebbed and flowed where it's become a major part of my life or less so it's it's whether it generates me an income or it doesn't um but it's always been a yearning of my soul to want to create and, and engage with new technology to create um and i think that's what's kind of led me here it's led me to the podcasting space it's led me to um you know, sharing my my inner world online on things like instagram and mm -hmm. facebook and creating videos and I just, it's so much fun, man. That's, yeah. I love this piece because for me, there's, there's something, a place we can create from where we're trying to create for what we think people want. It's like, I'm going to create this for you because you need this. And then there's an aspect where we actually get to create from that place of like, I don't, I don't really care if people like want listen to this or watch this, but I know this is being asked for me to be brought forth into this world. And sure, we can have that judgment, but I feel when I've connected to that and it's like, I know I need to bring this forth. It was like this podcast says that, you know, the insecurities, the fears that come up when I create anything new, but it, they're not really real. It just wants to keep us small. But when we're connected to that essence, it's like, hey, this wants to move through you. This wants to create. There is such a rich beauty when we let go of the outcome and, and just allow this to emerge from ourselves. And, and for me, this is such a different place because I, I think a lot of people dissociate from the identity of a creator because they're like afraid of judgment. For me, it was people and myself saying, oh, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't draw, I can't paint, like all these things I can't do, which I, I like the artistic field, which is very much a creator space because we think we're creating from something for someone else rather than actually creating from the space of I want to bring this for I want to see what happens if I draw like this and then I draw that like it, it's not about creating a beautiful piece of art or like receiving a certain amount of money creation is for creation's sake it gives life to a space and this is something we need to remember because like you, it was like, I'm having fun. And it sounds like it led you from one path to the next. It was like, cool. I tried to do, I did some rap and that was really fun. I love that because I'm currently listening to Will Smith's audio book and he's talking all about his rap career. And I'm like, yes, maybe, maybe give us some rap yeah. later. Um, and then like your creation flowed into the fitness space where it was, oh, now I'm doing vlogs and that. And did you find your creation kind of or where you felt to create kind of determined your path and where you were going in life and those different stages along the way. Yeah, it's it's hard to tell, man, because it it was either the expression of creation that drove it or where I was at the time I just created in that space. So, for example, I I started off in university studying veterinary science and it was very heady, you know, you've got to learn a lot, um, a lot of anatomy, a lot of physiology and things like that. And it's, it's a lot of just learning what is, not necessarily what could be. Um, it's, it's trying to read the signs and arguably there's some creation in it, but I didn't find a whole lot of creative expression. And I ended up leaving uh, that degree and jumped into a, a Bachelor of Health Science uh, majoring in nutrition and physiology. And one of the reasons I did that was because I was very interested in my own body and my own experience. Um, 
and I suppose fitness in itself, in itself, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Pumping Iron talks about bodybuilding as an art. You know, you're sculpting, you're sculpting your body. It's creation, literally. You're you're building muscles and shaping muscles in a particular way. So, I suppose an expression of fitness was creation, and then I moved into creating uh, vlogs and and things like that, documenting my experiences. That's something that I've always been interested in doing too, is documenting my experiences and sharing those. Um, I, I'm a very reflective person and actually some of the ways that I, I realise my reflections is when I speak to people. Um, sometimes I'm like, oh, shit, that's what I think after I've said it. Uh, but it's a very therapeutic process for me to talk because it reflects back what I um, what I think, feel and believe. And it gives me an opportunity to yeah. challenge that if I need to out there because once I've spoke it, it's out there and I can work with it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure whether it was the creation. I, I feel like it may have been my creative expression coming through no matter what I was doing, you know, in any stage. It just was had such a strong desire to come through. Um, and again, we're creating all the time. So whether we're cooking a meal, whether we're um, setting up a space or those sorts of things, we're always creating. Oh, one of the things I, I did want to mention, you mentioned, um, you mentioned Will Smith's book. As you were talking about the, the divine and, and create, you know, creation flowing through us, I was going to ask if you've read uh, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act, because that that is quite no. phenomenal. Rick Rubin, the producer. Mm. Mm, I've heard of Rick Rubin, but I have not touched on that. And now I'm deeply curious. Mm. You love it. Yeah, guarantee you love it. And your listeners will probably love it too. So. Mm, thank you, man. Thank you. I, I feel like that's a piece. I, I've, I've read The Artist's Way, which is, for me is a very similar thing. It's like the hero's journey of creation. And, and so for those that don't know, Joseph Campbell, he framed what was called the hero's journey, which is a stage of development for the individual, but it also basically determines every story ever told. At the start, a person is a hero, doesn't know, he goes on a journey to discover who he is, defeat his enemies, which can be his internal struggles, faces his challenges, and then on the other side, he becomes a new person. Now, in the artist's way, which is based upon the hero's journey, it speaks to this more deeply. And, and it's made me recognize their creative act is the modern day hero's journey. We, we live in a world where there's not really too much we can explore outside anymore. Like we, we, we basically have ability to see anything in the world. I was having a conversation the other day with my partner and I recognized that Basically, I've seen every animal in the world, even if I haven't seen it. And there's no surprise. It's not no like, oh, my God, that animal exists. Like imagine back in the day when you're wandering through a different like you, if you traveled overseas and you go wandering and you find a new animal, it would have been like, what is that then? And, and now we, we don't really have that mystery with the world. So I find that artist is or the creator is the one who actually is exploring the frontier of the psyche or the human world because it's like the internal world that is bringing through the through creation mm. Mm. yeah i love that i love that mm. yeah, that that was just a side tangent and a little bit of a rant because i feel like i i can get very very excited about this conversation around creation i had a piece a there. Side I'm if the i can find journey. I've literally got a board behind me that has like my side quests, my main quests, all of that on it for the audience. I've created a framework to make our work, like our business or our world into a game where we have quests, we have side quests, we've had uh, sub quests, there's experience, grinds, there's rewards, achievements. Um, if, if you want that, send me a message, but it's just a way to gamify this life and be like, oh, we, we are having fun. We are we are creating from this space that I found the piece. So for me, that there's this awareness that for some audiences and some people that may be listening, they may be dissociative from the idea that they are a creator. And for me, this is like a falsity 
but I, I'd love if you're, you could speak on to your experience of this. If you've met people who are like, I'm not a creator and then helping them recognize that, Hey, maybe they are, and they're just not seeing it. Mm. Yeah. And it comes from a lot of men. You know, I, I have primarily worked with men and youth throughout my, my mentoring journey. And a lot of men will say that I'm, I'm not a creator. I'm not in touch with my um, creative essence. And I'll say things, well, you know, do you build things with your hands? It's like, oh, yeah, well, that's creation. Do you, do you cook? Yeah, well, that's creation, right? And it's, it's letting them come to the realisation that they're already creating. It's just what they've deemed as creation is art class in high school that they were shit at, right? Oh, well, I couldn't draw, so I'm not a creator. I can't paint or I can't sing which all of that's a fallacy as well. You can, um, it's just the standard at which you set yourself and something you said earlier, what you're doing it for. You know, you may not be Mariah Carey or, or Beyonce and you're singing to make, you know, millions of dollars, but it doesn't mean you can't sing. Of course you can sing. You open your mouth and you, you speak and hum a tune, you can sing. Um, and so I think it's partly that is recognising first where you're already creating in your own life and then to setting the standard of what are you creating for and understanding that creation is something that wants to happen. We want to create. It's bubbling up inside us to want to happen. We need to come back to what do we enjoy creating? And one of the ways we can do that is by reflecting back in our childhood and what's something that we used to do as a kid that we've stopped doing now. Something that we used to do that we loved doing as a kid that we've stopped doing now. And when we take that reflection back, we can go, well, you know, as a kid, I really used to love building Lego, man. And I haven't, I haven't built anything like that for a long time. Cool. Well, let's start to explore that again. You know, understand why did you stop? Oh, because it doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't have to get you anywhere. That's the point. It doesn't have to get you anywhere. And now we start to understand, ah, the reason I was creating, the reason I thought I had to create was to make money, was to get ahead, was to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, rather than just be in the creative act itself, which is therapeutic. It's a therapeutic act to create. Um, it's something that we want to do. And something I've noticed on my own journey is when I'm, fulfilled creatively the rest of my life flows a lot easier the energy within my body flows a lot easier and actually um, more specifically sexual energy flows a lot easier because sexual energy is the energy of creation and this is something that um you know it, excuse me being crude and blunt but you know guys that are and, and again i say this because i work largely with men but guys that are masturbating a lot have lost that touch with their creative energy because they're just expelling it all the time, all the time, all the time. And it's like, well, let's hold on to that for a second and see if we can use that to create something else. And that kind of sexual transmutation um, and, and transmutation of that sexual energy into creative energy is something that's been really powerful for me as well. Um, yeah. I feel like there's a common theme here for a lot of men when they feel like, oh, they're not creators they're, they're, and they use their sexual energy in different ways, unhealthy ways. Uh, and for me, it feels like there's a block here that doesn't allow them to create from condition and from like society. Uh, now in yourself or from your own experience or what you've seen with the men in, that you work with, what have you felt is that block that maybe stops them using that energy in a more creative way? Maybe not understanding that that's what it can be used for. You know, it, sexual energy can sometimes feel uncomfortable and, and that's the same with creative energy. Sometimes it can feel uncomfortable. It can bubble up and we're like, oh, I just need to get this out. And so we go bust the nut and get it out or we, we bottle it up with the creative energy. We just bottle it up and hold it in, hold it in, hold it in. And so I think it's it's like we've caught this hot potato and we don't know what to do with it. And it's like when you realise that it's actually not that hot, let's let's stop, let's feel it, 
What does it feel like? What's its shape? How does it sit within my body? Where does it sit within my body? What's behind this? And how can I shape this into something? How can I maybe shape it into something new? And once we start to explore rather than expel, we can start to cultivate a new relationship with it. So I feel like that's part of that process is just sitting with it for a little while. You know, it doesn't mean you're never going to have an orgasm again or ever have a release again, but it's like sit with it for a little bit and try and feel what that feels like in your body, the creative energy. Sit with it for a little bit. You don't have to get up and go and do something all the time. Just sit, be still. And I think that, um, you know, practices like meditation and breath work, things that drop us into being still and in a reflective state, give us the ability to explore. And when we can explore, then we can figure out where this might want to go or what it might want to channel into. And, you know, if, you, if you've ever really been deep in a creative experience or a sexual experience, you're not in your mind. You're gone. It's like something else is working through you. And there'll be some people that are like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And, yeah, maybe because you're too much in your head. You know, those energies of creation, of sexuality and sexual energy, they are so potent. And if you allow yourself to just be taken by them within an experience, man, there's a lot of beautiful things in there. I feel that, man. I feel that. And like the piece I feel like I want to bring to this conversation is when we consider the world, and we consider the condition and that has been prevalent and the interlinked of sexual energy and creative energy, there's been a shunning of sexuality for the last however many years. That there's been a lot of done from religion, from church, from even just societal conditioning that says sexuality is bad. Now, when I, I see this on a grand scheme, I can see that we've come into society which has more rules more regulation more boxes for the human soul to fit within and so we try and fit within that context of okay this is who i am and this is who i need to be and now the thing with sexuality and creative energy or sexual energy and creative energy it wants to break a lot of those boxes it wants to us to step outside of that because it's actual life it's like the tree doesn't grow in the way that you want a tree to grow. The tree grows in the way that life is asking it to grow. It, it is the same with our sexual energy. It wants to move in its own way. It wants to be expressed in its own way. Same with creative energy. So when we have conditions around, oh my God, my sexual energy needs to look like this. I can, I, I'm a man, so I can't, you know, be in a more feminine, maybe flowy state, or I'm, I can't create because I can't draw it, which is just, I don't believe in my own ability to draw. I have judgment around my drawing. It creates a restriction mm -hmm. around that. And then that energy needs to be released somewhere. And mm -hmm. sh the shame around sexuality makes it the shadow. So a lot of people, men, especially be like, well, I can get one off, get rid of this. And then I don't have to look at the box I'm in there like the way I live my life and the constraint and the structure that keeps me trapped. And I think this is an important piece for a lot of men. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, man, my, my experience with it is um, at, at times I've had a libido that's so high that I, I just don't know what to do with it. And part of that is um, that I, in those times I haven't been creating, there hasn't been a balance. There's been no other outlet for that energy. Um, that that's how it manifests. But for me, that is an indication that, hey, man, it's time to create or you haven't been creating. And that's what I've learned through my own experience of exploration with that energy and with myself over time. And it's not something you necessarily come to straight away, but understanding the interplay of those energies for me and that when I'm creating, my sexual energy is, is way more balanced which feels good and feels right mm -hmm. for me. Um, and I feel when I'm creating a lot more whole, I'm, I'm able to um, relax into fun. And if I haven't created for a while, I get uptight. I get, <laughs> you know, I get irritated. I get frustrated. And that's not good to, to be around. It's not how I want to be. Um, and I know that when I'm mm -hmm. creating, be it 
writing, be it um, playing around with some things, be it the podcast, um, be it just creating with my daughter, right? Kids are a brilliant way, man, to, to bring you into that creative energy because they're, they're creating all the time, whether it's building blocks, whether it's drawing, um, whether it's uh, pretend with their, their imaginations, tapping back into that through with children is, is an incredible way to, to bring you back into that play because, I mean, sex is play and creation is play. That's what it is. It's, it's play and okay. that's, how, that's how we navigate the world. That's how we learn. We learn through play. And, um, yeah, coming back to that has been, in, in my more adult life, has been a really powerful thing, man. It's, um, yeah, it's beautiful. When you're talking there, I, I, I feel like I connect to almost the innocence of sexual energy and life force energy, but also the simplicity of play. Like I, I've worked with a lot of people at this point and, and one of the sins that I often see and I know from my own journey was the disownment of my inner child of like, I, I'm, I'm a man now, so I'm a big tough man and I've got to be working towards something. I've got to hustle, I've got to push, all, all that conditioning. And it, it's this remembrance that, oh, we all have a little child in, inside of ourselves. And, and I think this is what happens when we're around other children. It's like, oh, they get, they help us remind, oh, it gets to be fun. You know, we can create whole worlds with our imagination and then enter them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be so serious. Like we can be like, I'm walking up the street, but I'm really walking to the witch to go get herbs for my potion and brew that up. And it's like, we can actually live within that world frame. And it's not about the reality of the situation, but it's like, oh, does having that experience of like, oh, I could make this into a fantastical quest, like making everything you do in business a quest, does that add mm -hmm. to your world? Does that help expand it and add energy into your life? And, and I feel like that is something that wants to be brought back into this world on, mm -hmm. in such a deeper, deeper way. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like as you're speaking, you know, one of the things that we've fallen into is we've become consumers, not creators. You know, how many people are, I, I don't know this, but how many people are on Instagram that actually don't post? And they have a sense of pride around that. I used to. I used to have a sense of pride that I didn't post on Instagram and there were all these people out there trying hard. You know, that was a story I carried. And now I am one of those tryhards that I used to judge. And... But now I'm creating, I'm not consuming. And I, we need to balance that. We need to balance that because as a, as a general society, um, we are consuming so much. We consume um, movies, we consume music, we consume uh, books even. We're not, we're not creating those things ourselves anymore because they're handed to us. You just flick on Netflix and so on out. And, and that world building that you're talking about is there for us. It's laid out. You know, you look at another example is the book, you know, June. June is like a thick, mm -hmm. thick brick. Like, and you look at that and go, oh, do I read that and have to build that world in my mind? Or do I just go and watch episode one that's just dropped? Right. The easy option is to just watch episode one. Um, I, on that same example, I've revisited uh, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So I'm currently reading The Lord of the Rings. I just recently finished The Hobbit. And the, the world building of Tolkien in those books is phenomenal. Like he is a master, an absolute master. And there is no way you can create to that extent without having a connection with your inner child. There, there is no way. Um, that is, yeah, it's imagination beyond belief. It's so beautiful. Um, and to go in and be invited into that world and invited to build that world within your own mind is a really, um, it's a really potent experience. And I, I then watched the movie. So I read the Hobbit and then I watched the movies after it and, um, just being able to look at the difference between those two experiences and the way that it was created on screen versus the way it was created in my mind as I read. Um, and yeah, that's something I think we've, we've moved away from too. We just, and whether it's part of hustle culture or, 
you know, the conditioning that, hey, look, it's time to grow up now. It's time to put that wizard hat away. It's time to put those fairy wings down. Like it's time to be a big boy and a big girl. You've got to go and you've got to earn a job and you've got to serious, serious, serious. Like we've lost lost connection with that part of ourselves um, that is so vital. It's, it's so vital. Um, and I, I feel like that's a potentially a big one for men, but all people is we've lost connection with that, that inner creative little boy or that creative little girl who um, wanted to explore and wanted to play. And at some point they got told or they, they were led to believe that it was time to put that away. Oh, I, I love when you were speaking just how many rules I realize I've broken to get to where I am. Like you're like, put the wizard hat away. There's a wizard hat in the background. Yeah. You can't see it on camera. But when, when I do my quest, I put on my wizard hat because I'm like, I want to embody yeah. that. And, and yeah. there was this journey I went on in business where it was like, oh, I was in the hustle. I was like creating because I need to make this happen. I need to make the money. I need to get to the next stage and get the next fin. And that was a lot of my energy and where it was going. And I asked myself this question one day of like, what would I create if I was working from my inner child? And that changed the trajectory of my business. It made me kill off a lot of what I was creating. Cause I was like, oh, I'm doing this because I think I should or because I think this is what men need and all of this. And I was like, mm. I don't want to add more shit to the world. I want to create something new. I want to create something mm. that speaks from my own soul. And mm. I think too often we get caught in that loop of I, I need to do this because that's what it is because there's a disconnect from that child. And 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 I love what you're speaking to in regards to the books because I, I'm, I'm currently reading The Wheel of Time. I'm addicted. I'm like on book 14 at the moment and it's the last one. And I'm like, I want to go read it right now. I'm so in this story. And I tried to watch the series and I watched the first episode and I was like, this is like, there was a lack. There was a lack that I could not connect to it. I've talked to other people and they're like, I love this series. And I'm like, there's vital pieces that I created from my imagination that aren't there. And, and it just doesn't have the same appeal. And so often when something will not have the same appeal, like I don't think of many movies that I've watched that have had the same appeal to me as the books of them I've read. Like June, I, I love June, one of my favorite books of all time. The movie, they did awesome. I, I'm, I'm pretty stoked for what they did, but it's still not the book for me. And, and no matter what they yeah. do, it won't be because that's the imagination. That's what's key. I think so often. Mm. Mm. Yeah, man. I mean, the same with The Hobbit, right? Like, uh, I think The Hobbit was a little trash. Lord of the Rings can't falter. Like, that was an, it's one of the best uh, book to movie adaptations ever. That that's Those three movies are absolutely phenomenal. Um, but, yeah, I, I hear you, and it's, it's lacking that vital piece of imagination that's uniquely you. Right? It's uniquely you because... Even though those words are on the page and even though the author was building a specific thing in their head, it's not what you're going to receive. And that's what's cool about creation is it's it's got your unique stamp on it. As you bring it forward in the world, it's, it's your unique stamp. So, you know, something I've realised is as, as creators, we're not competitors. Right? Although you and I might both work with men in a mentorship capacity, it's different. Because what I can create and, and bring forward and the men I appeal to are different to the men you appeal to. And that's beautiful yeah. because even if we're saying the exact same thing, and, and a lot of the time we do, and that's why I think we get on so well, um, we're, we're doing that in a different way. We're bringing forward in a different way. Right? You look different to me. You know, We wear different clothes. We have a unique style. Even those little bits are, are all creation. You know, how many of us are just walking around wearing the clothes that we think we should wear versus wearing the clothes that actually appeal to us in the way that we look, you know, the way we want to look and express ourselves in the world. It's, um, you know, it's one of the reasons I have tattoos. It's one of the reasons I have dreadlocks. Um, it's one of the reasons I have piercings and wear the clothes that I do is because that is an expression of who it is that I want to be. Um, and it's an expression of creativity. 
It's an expression of creativity that I want to bring out into the world as, as my unique self. I think it's one of the biggest sins in this world that people feel like they need to be someone else to do what they want to do in this world. And I, I think this is the piece you're speaking to. I, I've worked with a lot of people who come to me and they're like, I feel like an imposter and they have this vision, they have this mm-hmm. dream and they're like, who am I to bring this forth? And I'm like, you are the exact persons that needed for that dream because otherwise you wouldn't have the dream. Like that, that, that's it for me. It's yeah. like why you're given that yeah. gift is because you're the exact person that's right for that. And it breaks my heart when a person's like, who am I? Cause I've, I've done that. I'm like, who am I Dean? You, you used to have a list. Who are you to be creating a podcast? You have no right to speak. What do you have to say? All, all the bullshit stories they, they come to us, but it's like, I was given a vision, a dream that like lives in my heart. I know when I turn away from it and I'm like, Oh, I don't know about that. I feel more dead. I feel disconnected. I don't feel as alive. And, and then when people are like, I'm not that person, I, I, I don't know if I have the right to do this. Well, you were born here. This is why you're here. And, and like, this is where I see the world going. We we're living in a beautiful time. Like me and you, we, we're creators, like in the more traditional sense, we're creating on Instagram and all of that. But I see this as expanding so much more because people can create a business out of things they love now. Like when in the history of the world has that occurred? It's like, I love to support people. I love to help people. I love to do that. I get to create a business from that. Other people can create it in their own way. Like if someone taught me how to paint beautiful oil paintings, I would pay for that. I would love that. You know, it's like someone could teach that and we have the ability to learn that. And it's like, this is what has excited me in this day and age, like where we are going. And I'm curious for you, if, if you've thought about like where we're going as a species when we're starting to go into this creator world where, you know, each of us can recognize we are creators, that we have something to share. Mm. Yeah, it's... Look, I think the more that each individual connects with what is the, the creative vision that lives inside them and works towards bringing that forward, uh, the more beautiful world we'll be in. Um, because when you're creating from that, like, you, you don't care about what else is going on. You're not trying to bring people down. You're not trying to, you're not tied up and bent up in yourself. You're not judging others or feeling judgment from others you're feeling fulfilled like when we're able to connect with that that creative vision that lives inside us and take the steps towards it i mean the world will just be a much better place um and that's one of the things that i really harp on when i work with people is what's your vision you know like what what do you want to bring into the world be it with your family be it in your relationship be it in your individual work um be it uh, be it in your, the legacy and the things that you want to be leave behind. Like, what does your your soul or your your being desire um, in this world? What what does it want to bring forward? And sometimes the answer to that is I don't know yet, and that's okay. And that's where I would work with somebody to remove some of this conditioning or some of the excuse me gunk to to allow that transmission to come through, to allow that vision to be received. Um, Because the way I I think about it is we're like an antenna. And there's scientific truth to this, right? We're picking up vibrations all the time, feedback in, feedback out all the time. And if that antenna is bent out of shape um, because of the food we're eating, because of the stress we're under, because of the environments we're in, because of the substance we're ingesting, all of that sort of stuff, if it's bent out of shape, it's not going to be able to pick up that authentic, um, you know, the vision or that creative energy that wants to move through us. But when we start to pull some of that away, we are open to receiving. And as we start to receive that vision, like you've said, it becomes unbearable. Man. Like it becomes unbearable to not do it. Um, and now what I will say is some people have more gunk on that antenna, antenna than others and some have it not by their own choice either. Right? Like some people are living in situations not by their own choice that are, are really detrimental to their being. Um, 
you know, and be that insecurity, financial insecurity, food insecurity, um, violent environments, all of those sorts of things, it becomes very hard to be able to, to connect to that. So, um, but again, I'm saying if people were just living their authentic self and, and majority of people were living out their visions, that we wouldn't have those issues either because people wouldn't be looking to try and get one up on somebody else. So, yeah, that I think the more we create from that point of view, the, the better world we're going to be in. Um, and that creative energy I've found is really pure. You know, it's not it's not an OnlyFans content creator. Like, it, it's this really pure beautiful energy that wants to to serve and and bring value to yeah. others um yeah that's that's how i i feel about that mm -hmm. uh, that's beautiful man thank you thank you so i, I feel like i want to segue with this piece here similar thread but also weave in some other elements we talked about earlier is like we, we've talked about you about to become father to your second child and you've already had your first child. And I think that's such a beautiful aspect of this creation that you're bringing through. And, and I know for you that reconnection to your lineage as well has been really powerful in building that and developing that. And what I was feeling was that in this new, new birth, your new child coming into this world, in a way you are becoming a creator for their worldview and their reality by reconnecting to your own past and helping heal that line. So I'm curious of that process for yourself, man, when you afford of bringing children into this world and that process of bringing new life and also wanting to reconnect to your ancestry as well. What was that process like to come into that? Mm. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so for those that don't know, I have Aboriginal family connections up to modern day Newcastle and through central New South Wales. That's the land of the Awabakul and the Wiradjuri people. Um, I didn't grow up on my country. I, I grew up in Mildura on Barkindji and Lachi Lachi country. And my grandmother, um, where my lineage is through, was a, a member of the Stolen Generation. Um, so again, for those that don't know or aren't, familiar with the Australian context. Um, the Stolen Generations are a period of, of Australian history where a lot of Aboriginal children were removed from their families under assimilation policies in an attempt to uh, really decimate and disconnect Aboriginal children from their, their culture and their family heritage. Um, the funny thing about that is you can try as best you can, but it's always going to find its way back. And it might not be the next generation or the generation after, but there's going to be something inside these people that you can't sever. As much as you try, um, you, you'll never be able to sever that. And that's why, you know, Aboriginal culture here in Australia is the oldest surviving culture on the planet. Um, you know, there's scientific estimates that Aboriginal people have been here for 65 to 80,000 years. Yeah, it's Aboriginal people. We say we've always been here uh, and the science is just catching up. So... There's this knowing and this, this practicing of culture um, that's continued on uh, and expressed itself in beautiful new ways as the landscape around us has changed. Very similar to creative energy, right? Like no matter what you do, you can't sever that from yourself. It's a piece of you and it's always going to want to come through. And I actually would extend that to anybody, right there, anybody, whether you're um, whether you're English, whether you're um, Australian, whether you're from New Zealand, whether you're Maori, whether you're um, from Southeast Asia, there's an element of your culture that really wants to always come through and it's just different layers of disconnection from that. Um, but it's still there. It's definitely still there. Um, and so for me, what does it mean to bring that through um, to my family as a, fa as a father? Well, it's a piece that I want to bring through and because of the context of my family history and the disconnection of my grandmother and to my mother, my mother's learned a lot and reconnected a lot with her culture as she got older, which has meant that I've been able to reconnect with my culture at a lot younger age. And so now my daughter gets to grow up and experience life in that culture now from, from birth. And literally from birth, we, um, when my daughter uh, was born, she's two and a half now, uh, 
my mum and one of my aunties from back home wove a traditional birthing mat. So this is something that um, Aboriginal babies would have been birthed on or, or carried on really close after birth. And now we didn't birth, uh, my, my wife didn't birth our baby onto this mat, but we had it as a symbol of this beautiful new experience and the entering of the baby into the world. What we did, however, do was we had a, a wooden coolerman um, and that wooden coolerman I ended up sanding down and, and working myself. And a coolerman's like a little bowl that would have been used to carry, um, you know, herbs or gatherings or um, even children it could have been used to carry children. And we, when my daughter was born and then my, my wife birthed the placenta, we put the placenta onto the coolerman to create a placenta print. And so that coolerman now is my daughter's and it has a marking of the placenta, the thing that gave her life that was inside of you know, my wife and, and feeding her. And now that is marked there forever um, and it will be on that piece of wood that was created and taken from a tree and shaped by myself. And so it becomes this intertwining of, um, you know, my daughter's arrival into this plane, into this world and our cultural connection. Um, and we'll do the same for my next child. We've got another coolerman. Uh, we've got another birthing mat that's been woven in a different way um, to my daughter's and the coolerman's a different shape. But we'll follow that same process. Uh, and that is a way of embedding that cultural experience and cultural connection in the modern day now into my children's life from the very beginning. Um, you know, and that will continue on in various different iterations and how they learn and um, the sorts of things that they're exposed to. So, yeah, it's, um, and, and again, just in the rituals of every day, how we sit down and have meal time, how we, um, we're lighting a candle at dinner and that's something that we're doing. We're saying a blessing on our food before we eat. Um, you know, all of these sorts of things are different ways that we can create our lifestyle and um, the culture of our family that is informed by the culture of my ancestors and my lineage. So I'm bringing that through and expressing it today, um, yeah, within my family. So. What has that meant on a personal level for yourself to really allow yourself to reconnect? Oh, man, it's extremely fulfilling. It's, it's extremely fulfilling because there's a knowing in my body that this feels right. And yeah, it's, it's, it is that it feels right. And it feels, um, there's a deep connection to those that have gone before me and a remembrance, I would say it's a remembrance of something deep within my, within my DNA, there's a remembrance of these things. And while it might look different on the surface or within the context, um, there are elements that are coming through, uh, and, you know, in a way, I know how proud my grandmother would be to know that this is where we're through practicing this, we're honoring her. We're also honoring every other person that's come before us. You know, it's, it's paying reverence or bringing reverence rather to, um, to what they endured, what they had taken away from them and what we can now bring back. And it feels like a, it feels like a responsibility to bring it back. Um, and to celebrate it and go, you know, this is something we can be really proud of. Um, and it's allowed me to stand really strong in my identity and, and that aspect of my identity and stand up and say, you know, this feels right. This feels right for me. And, and in a way, I want to protect it. I want to protect it because it's sacred. It's, it's something that's sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for me, when you're speaking, it, it feels like you're creating a, a reconnection like there's this new creation of how this looks in this modern world but there's also a deep reverence and a deep lineage that is coming through that so that we can have the awareness of what that is in this modern world and I, and I feel like that's needed so deeply like I, 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 we spoke of this briefly before coming on like for the Aboriginal people, this disconnection has occurred more recently. And I still feel as a white man, as like 
cultural lineage from that, uh, from British, from Ireland, all these different places, there's a disconnection for myself. So there's like not only for Indigenous people where you bring in through a transmission of like what it means to connect to ancestry, but also for mm -hmm. me as like from a different lineage, I, I feel there's this invitation. And I know for our listeners as well, of like, cool, what does our lineage like ask us to do? Like, how does it look when mm -hmm. we connect to that and bring that through? Because I believe we've all got gifts that we can share for one another and bring to life and like, your lineage can teach me things, my lineage can teach you. And like in that we can have a beautiful honor in, but also a coming together in a creation of something new in a completely different way. Mm. Yeah, man, I, I love that. And I that's something that I try and bring to people's attention too, is, you know, um, in this space that we're in, the kind of health, wellness, um, new age spirituality, whatever you want to call it, um, there is elements of what I've seen and, and feel as cultural appropriation of Indigenous practices. Um, and while I don't think the majority of these have malicious intent, um, what I feel like it is, is a crying out for a reconnection, a reconnection to a deep cultural wisdom. And that it's Indigenous practices are accessible. You can go and buy smudge sage smudge in every fucking crystal store around the country right you can go and buy uh, a yiraki or a didgeridoo in a souvenir shop at the airport and i mean man those things make me wild um but they are accessible it doesn't mean that they're right but they are accessible and people when you connect back to that when you burn sage there's undoubtedly this feeling of all oh, this there's something ancient about this and because there is, you hear the hum of a didgeridoo or, or the, the banging of a drum and something inside you goes, oh, there's something deep and, and ancient to this. There is. Now, what does that look like for you? What, what does that look like for your lineage? Not someone else's lineage, because if you connect to somebody else's lineage, you get, you're going to get this, a tiny aspect of what that actually feels like. But what did your ancestors play you know and i know we've spoken about this before right drums drums were around in all cultures everywhere across the globe or ma majority of cultures now you could pick up and play a native american drum or what if your lineage is from uh, the british isles or from scandinavia and you pick up a traditionally made nordic drum and you play that now tell me how you feel. Like, let's get back to that. And when we get back to that place, you don't have to surrogate or supplement somebody else's culture for something that you feel like you you want or something that's your birthright. It's your birthright to connect to your culture just as it's my birthright to connect to mine. And so let's share that birthright and let's share our culture in a way that honours each of them, not in a way that goes, oh, yeah, I feel yours. Yours look cool. I'm going to have that. Um, because there's layers of complexity around those things. And so I always encourage people. I say, you know, you connect with these practices. Beautiful. Now, what does that look like for your lineage? Let's do some research. And for Aboriginal people, that disconnect and, and that severance, the attempted severance, rather, of that cultural connection only happened 300 years ago. Now, for somebody that comes from uh, a British lineage, those Indigenous practices, um, those, in a way, pagan practices, there is layers of complexity and multiple, multiple generations where there was a, an attempted severance of that. But that still burns inside you. It burns inside you like my desire and, and my... Um, yeah, my desire to bring forward my culture burns inside me. And so let's connect to that. Okay. And you tell me and you show me what that means for you. Because I get to experience, I'd love it. I'd love you to experience that also. I'm, I'm feeling this conversation deeply. And, and, and the piece that is there for me is this level of admitting our own ignorance. 
like like I, I've had this conversation with you several times where I'm like I'm ignorant of a few of these things and I think in our our culture there's such an aversion to owning that disconnect or not knowing it's like hey I, I don't actually know and and that be okay because that from that place we can actually learn then we can get curious then we can start to explore but so many people especially when it comes to I guess spirituality it's like the ego becomes that and and I know for me a lot of these beautiful like for me a lot of Native American that was an access point for me into spirituality and it was like that keyhole that allowed me to open a door and be like oh my god there's a such a greater world that I wasn't aware of and it gave me a pathway into that but that there was an ego association with that of like now that's me that's who I am but there's a stagnation that occurs if I don't allow there to be a deeper invitation of like actually like what did my lineage do what was my like birthright as you're speaking to like what would have I done if I was born a thousand years ago what would my ancestors been doing how would have they been operating how would have they been sharing their soul with one another and if we can allow ourselves to sit within that ignorance not as a way of avoiding it but saying shit I I don't know right now and that's okay because then that gives me the opportunity to learn not as a way to say I'm ignorant and I'll never learn that's a completely different kettle of fish that is avoidance and we need to address that but actually being like oh cool yeah there is lineage that I've used because I I know I have I've used different lineages to help me connect spiritually or like whatever it was because that was all I knew and it's like cool I, I know from our conversation there's a deeper invitation for me and there's ways I've started to honor that. Like I've got a mugwort plant growing outside my balcony. Like for me, mugwort is that I, I start to connect to my lineage because that's, you know, that's the Druidic, that's the Celtic. There's invitation there, but that's only just begun. But starting there, it, it gives an open invitation. So it's not too, for me, it's not too shame or shun anything I've used up until this point. Like I've got a, drum on the wall there I don't claim to have anything from Native American culture or learning from that but that drum was given to me and I I trust that it was given to me for a reason so I'll still use that but I also won't claim that hey I'm doing this from a Native American place that's not that's not me but to honor my own journey with it and to speak truthfully from that and to also speak truthfully of my own ignorance in that situation Mm. yeah brother and i feel like that's a really it's a mature place to come from when it comes to this and and the sharing of the culture and as you go on your journey you're able to learn more and share more of of what is deeply uh, of connection to you and i i would just love to see more of that you know there was a time i got angry about it i got angry around what i saw as cultural appropriation um and it made me it made me angry because of the, the the systematic attempt at trying to remove that from Aboriginal people. That's what made me angry and that people were now bringing that back while other Aboriginal people still had you know, wounds that they needed to heal. Um, and that to me wasn't fair. And now I think I've come to a place with it that I, I want to use those examples to help people reconnect to their own culture and and reconnect to their own lineage and ancestry um, and own uh, lineage of spirituality what does that look like for you and your perspective because i don't know and i'd love to be invited along that journey i'd love to be invited to the practices that you deeply connect with when you learn how to guide them Um, you know and i'll do the same for you yeah I, i would love to get to a place like that and i'm seeing it more you know, I interviewed a guy on my podcast who who did you know very similar to you. Mugwort is a part of his lineage, and he brought that through in a, a fire ceremony that he was holding for men. And I thought, what a beautiful example of, of being able to share and bring that forward. So, and I think with this, there is that piece of exploration, like of, of willing to explore. Like so much of spirituality can become from a place of ego where it's like, I've got the crystals, I've got the sage, and now this is who I am. And 
it may not feel right. Like you may be there with your sage, with your crystals, and it's like, this is just kind of looks right, but it's not actually who I am. And, and mm. there's an invitation to actually start to explore of like, what, what calls to you? What really feels right for you? Like for me, it's been looking at like Western esoteric traditions of magic. Like there, there've been things that have been passed down for thousands of years. And I do practices like that, that are completely out of the box for a lot of people, but they feel like more powerful than say sometimes when I do breath work, it's like, Oh, that's, that's part yeah. of my lineage from that. And without that, without that willingness to explore or being stuck in the identity of, Oh, I don't know about magic or I don't know about like stuff like that. It would have really limited that ability to firstly get it wrong. Cause I could have done that. And it's like, Oh, this isn't for me. And that's okay. Move on and continue to find what yeah. works. But that permission of this, this feels true for me okay, let me sit with this. Let me get to know this, whether that's for a meditation, if it's like anything from anything, let yourself explore and get to know that before becoming this is me. Like that, that for me is a big piece. For, for you, if there was like an invitation you could give people in terms of this or like a share and you could invite people deeper into themselves, was there something you could offer for this topic? Yeah, look, brother, I would say if there's the desire there, there's there's a desire to connect with spirituality, or maybe you have, maybe you've started to connect with some of these cultural practices and you're like, oh, you know, I went to this event and Sage really it did something for me or I heard um, the didgeridoo play or a drum play and it really resonated within me deeply. That could be an invocation um, that that ripple has started uh, that here's the beginning of your exploration and now instead of saying oh the didgeridoo resonated with me that's mine i'm going to go out and learn and play it and whatever it's like yes connect with that and hold reverence for it and acknowledge that you have a connection to that now start to explore well actually where am i from you know, where is my cultural heritage where's my ancestral lineage what did they practice? When did they stop practicing that? What is the history of all these things? These are questions you can start to ask yourself. And, um, you know, the creative mind going full circle is a curious mind. Be curious, open to curiosity. Curiosity, play and creativity are all interwoven. And you start that journey, who knows what's coming. You know, that, would be my, that would be my offer and my invitation. That is beautiful, man. I really, really appreciate that. I feel like we're moving to the end of this conversation. This has been truly, truly beautiful, man, to drop in and connect and share even from creation to cultural appropriation and be able to explore a lot of this and for myself, learn and continue to have these conversations. Uh, before we finish up, brother, is there anything left alive? And then after that, we'll give some space. If there's anything you've got coming up to share with the audience or how to connect with you as well. Mm. Just to, uh, by the way, I think that's a beautiful title from creation to cultural appropriation or, or cultural appropriation to creation. So just <laughs> TM that one. Um, but I think just remembering that we're all creators. We're all creators. We create every single day. Um, and it's just layers of story and conditioning that have blocked that for us. So I encourage everybody in, in whatever way that you can is create today, create tomorrow, create every day and connect to that place. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place to be operating from. Um, Thank you, man. So if anyone was looking for you, man, or if there's any offerings you have up that you'd love to share with the audience, how would they find you? How would they connect? Mm, thank you, man. Um, my work's taking a little bit of a pause for a while, um, and that's with the arrival of my second child. Uh, I'm going into the baby butter bubble. But I'll still be posting regular content on my Instagram and my Facebook. Uh, Facebook, Seth Westhead, uh, W-E-S-T-H-E-A-D. Uh, and Instagram, S underscore Westhead. 
Um, I also have an active mailing list. All the links to that are in the, the bio of my Facebook and uh, Instagram. On my mailing list, I share some more deeper reflections and any new work that's coming up weekly. Uh, also run a podcast that's just started season two as well. So the Sentient Savage podcast uh, is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and also uh, the Buzzsprout web app. So they're the best ways to get in contact, uh, follow my work, follow what I do, follow what I create. And uh, yeah. Cool, 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 Seth. Absolute pleasure to have you on. I highly recommend if anyone wants to connect, go find them, go find Seth, give him a follow, give him a message. If you have any questions, brother, so great to have you on. Thank you, man. Thanks, brother. Big love. Big love.